Welcome, travelers, to the RV Connects podcast, your bi-weekly dose of travel tips, tricks, stories, and guides from our Canadian family of four who roam all over North America and show you how you can travel further than you ever thought on your vacations from work. I'm Melina. And I'm Dan. Today is episode 40, and we are continuing our coverage of the RV Connects 2021 Grand Tour with a two-part profile of the Drumheller Valley in Alberta, Canada. On the next two episodes, we'll talk about the unique geography of the Alberta Badlands, the sometimes dark history of the coal capital of Canada, and of course, we'll look at the unique reasons Drumheller is considered the dinosaur capital of the world. We're also going to talk about what happens when your electric jack gives up the ghost, craps out, and you have to come up with some hillbilly solutions to get your truck and trailer decoupled. But first, we'd love to ask for a favor. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving a review of the podcast. Star reviews and written comments really do make a difference in who sees the podcast. And of course, our goal is to bring great content to as many RVers as we can. And if you don't already follow us on Facebook or Instagram, please do, as you'll be treated to a variety of video antics, Dan's infrequent but hilarious beef jerky reviews, and of course, images that go along with all our travels so you can see for yourself what we experience on the road and save the posts that will help you plan your trips even better. So today we are talking Drumheller. Founded in 1911 and neatly nestled along the Red Deer River in an area known as Coal Canyon, Drumheller was, as you could imagine by that name, a bustling coal town once upon a time. The last load of coal was shipped from the area in 1979, and Drumheller began a swift decline until large-scale paleontological works ramped up in the late 70s and early 80s. I'm sure I butchered that, but, you know, dinosaur diggy stuff. Um, So the late 70s and early 80s were a period of time which saw an eye-opening amount of new information about dinosaurs, and it also saw the creation of the Tyrell Museum, which is now the Royal Tyrell Museum, the royal, of course, being beside stowed after a visit from Queen Elizabeth II in 1990, and the museum opened in 1985. Tourism is now the major industry in Drumheller due to the wide range of year-round activities for amateur paleontologists, hikers, and thrill seekers alike. It is located just an hour and a half from Calgary, three hours from Edmonton, uh, just under five hours from Saskatoon, and roughly 12 hours each from either Vancouver or Winnipeg, making it a prime location for a weekend getaway, long weekend trip, or a vacation full of exploration. There are so many things to do that we'll probably need future episodes and future trips to cover them all. But today we're going to cover Drumheller as an RV destination, a little bit about the town and our visit to the Royal Tyrell Museum. But first, let's maybe talk about the Alberta Badlands. The Canadian Badlands span southeast from Drumheller all the way through the southwest corner of Saskatchewan and still further south into the States. So named by French explorers as being bad to cross, the Badlands aren't deserts exactly, we'll call them desert adjacent, and they occur where rain is infrequent in areas where lonely soil retains similar rates of erosion, and runoff water washes away large amounts of sediment, resulting in a stunning landscape of multi-hued mesas, which are flat top mountains, deep winding gullies, and wind-shaped hoodoos. These rocks are known in our house as bacon rocks, uh, something that Isla coined when she was, I don't know, maybe seven or eight, and we were going through Utah, and she thought that the rocks, the layers of striations or different layers of rocks looked like streaky bacon or a slice of bacon. The stunning otherworldly landscape of the Canadian Badlands teems with wildlife and unusual species from prairie rattlesnakes and horned lizards to prickly pear cacti. It's a great place for bird watching, backcountry hiking, canoeing, cycling, or simply soaking up the wondrous sights. Now, the Badlands are large, and exploring all the secrets would be a, a trip right in itself. But the most famous places in Alberta to experience this would be in the Drumheller Valley, down in Dinosaur Provincial Park, Cypress Hills Provincial Park, and Riding on Stone Provincial Park, which are all located along that swath of Badlands in Alberta. Now, this trip, as we mentioned, we decided to stay in Drumheller and in the Drumheller Valley, both for the convenience of being in a walkable location and to have a full service site within 15 minutes of all the area's main attractions. So let me just paint the picture for you a little bit. I know that when we think of Western Canada, you feel like you leave Ontario, 
you drive across the prairies until you run smack into the Rocky Mountains, and then you get into the Rocky Mountains and the beauty of BC. The Badlands are this little gem that's nestled in between the prairies and the Rockies, and it's really spectacular landscape. It reminded me a little bit of New Mexico and a little bit of Utah, and you said it reminded you of California to Las Vegas. Yeah, it, it really does kind of appear out of nowhere. Like you are literally driving through prairie and then you take a turn and you're driving down the highway and you just start going down this long and winding road down, down, down into the valley. And it's sort of funny, like how fast it changes from, you know, these beautiful wheat grasslands to kind of really a desert landscape or a semi-arid landscape. It's it's a, just a really stunning part of the country. Yeah, it's really amazing. So did you want to talk a little bit about camping in Drumheller? Yeah, for sure. There are 23 campgrounds in and around Drumheller. So there is a ton of places to camp. And there are, there's any type of camping you can imagine from backwoods camping to tent camping to unserviced, etc. You can find what you're looking for. There are three RV parks closest to the downtown core. One is River Grove RV Park. Uh, one is Dinosaur RV Park. And then there's Dino's Nest RV Park. So we stayed at River Grove, but all of them are within six minutes walk of downtown Drumheller proper. Now, River Grove, where we stayed, has a total of 140 sites. There are 29 full service, 54 just power and water, nine unserviced RV sites, 44 tent sites, and 10 cabins. So did you want to talk a little bit about amenities? Yeah. So first amenity we'll talk about, it does have Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is good for checking your email and simple web browsing. It's not going to be good if you need to work from your trailer because you're combining a work and vacation trip and it's not going to be good if you want to stream something from Netflix let's say Mm -hmm. but but it's there they have very clean washrooms they have coin operated showers they have a coin operated laundry mat they have dishwashing stations if you're a tent camper they have a small convenience store and they have an arcade and actually two playgrounds one right at the front gate of the park inside the park and one just outside of the park, which is probably a city park of sorts. Mm -hmm. Both of them are great though. One thing I will say about the bathrooms, super clean, very, very, very clean. And that's kind of always our mark of what makes a good RV park or not, particularly with this park where the majority of sites don't have full hookups. So you're not going to get a ton of people showering in their trailers. They're going to go to the bathhouses to do that. And uh, anytime I went in the bathrooms, they were spick and span. They were really clean. The staff on site, super, super friendly. The sites are close together, but not in that typical kind of line them up and knock them down type RV park, like a KOA where everything's kind of in the line. I would say that this RV park layout kind of, let's just say it moves with the landscape landscape a little bit. Yeah, that's the way to put it. And I kind of gather that probably at some point this RV park may have been smaller and perhaps they added on sites but maybe didn't give an overall plan to you know city planning for like the rest of how the loops would lay out so the loops were a little bit confusing I know the girls and I even got lost on a walk one time uh, because it's not laid out like a typical campground but with all of that being said the sites although they were close together were still fairly private I mean you can see all your neighbors but they were laid out in such a way that you're not staring right in to somebody's window. Yeah, it wasn't too bad and it works. There's rigs of all different sizes in there. So I wouldn't be worried about trying to get a big one or a small one in there. Mm -hmm. The only thing I will say about the laundry, although it was also clean, it was fairly expensive for a campground laundry. So it was $4 each to wash and dry. And anybody who regularly does laundry on the road knows that sometimes the dryers aren't the best and you're not gonna get a full dry the first time. So I really didn't wanna pay $12 a load. So we just packed up, uh, we, I think we had about like three loads to do. So we took it in to downtown Drumheller or just past da- like old downtown. And there's an Esso station there with a coin op laundry at the back of that gas station. Really super clean, fast, good dryers. It was a whole lot cheaper. And they also had a coin op ca- car wash on the site. So while we waited for our laundry, we gave the truck a good wash. And it wasn't too busy at that one. So you were able to use two or three dryers and washers all at the same time and get it all done in one big go and not have to share with anybody else. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the dumping station here. When you exit the park, it's not entirely clear through the signage, whether you go left or you go right. But what you have to do is go through the dumping station. It's right in the middle of this 
gravel area and you can dump and there's only one dumping station of course it's sunday it gets busy everybody wants to leave at the same time they actually had a person from the park there that would marshal you when it started to get backed up and he would say hey if you need to dump feel free to go on to one of the empty sites that has a sewer hookup and just dump in there so sometimes people did that sometimes people just stayed in line to dump at the dump station but he would also say hey if you want to go to canadian tire or you want to go to the co-op that's in town you can dump there as well because they both had dump stations and i think what we came to learn in western canada and i guess in northwestern ontario too there's dump stations in many towns and i think people are used to just pulling into a dump station that's not at the park and dumping there Mm -hmm. the best way i would pinpoint this layout is like when you pull into the park you actually stop right at the dump station to even go check in for your site so the dump station is sort of in the very middle in almost like an island where the road goes on either side of it if that makes sense yeah it's uh not tucked away that's for sure Mm -hmm. They also sell firewood at the park. I noticed that whether you're going to buy your firewood at a local gas station or at Canadian Tire, it all comes from the same person. A little bit more expensive in the park, but, you know, they need to keep the lights on. It was a little bit cheaper at Canadian Tire because we were already picking up some stuff about the failed jack, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think you've got everything there. I'd say this is a very much a family-friendly park. There were lots of kids, but it was not a party park. It was not a noisy park. So there's young families there. Kids are up riding their bikes doing what kids do they went to bed they probably tuckered out their parents they all went to bed and then everybody got back up the next morning and did it all over again but a nice quiet park definitely not a, a party park mm -hmm. yeah for sure it seems definitely like a weekend destination type of park and i will say the moment people checked out within like half an hour somebody was there cleaning up the fire pits and like setting it up for the next guest so it's very much a high volume park so they they kind of had that part down to a science i think location wise it's absolutely fantastic for downtown drumheller it's right across the street from kind of the the focal point i guess of downtown drumheller which is the world's tallest dinosaur that's kind of their claim to fame which is which is actually uh an a viewing platform that you can climb up and that is also the tourist information. So that's almost right across the road from the campground. It's also where the uh, town splash pad is. There's an indoor outdoor pool. So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff for you to do right outside the gates of the park that if you have, you know, kids and you're staying there for a couple of days and just looking for a day where you can just kind of hang out near the trailer, perfect location. Yep, absolutely. Did you want to talk about the town a little bit? I do want to talk about the town. I actually have a... Town crush. I have a town crush. It's true. I love Drumheller. Like, I love it. I love the downtown. It's super quaint. I think they are trying their darndest. And I think they are being very, very successful at refocusing Drumheller as a tourist area. The downtown is very clean. There are still some issues with, you know, maybe store fronts that are still empty. But... Quite honestly, I think, you know, from what I've seen, the marketing materials, the amount of effort that the town puts into Drumheller as a tourist destination, as a foodie destination, as a destination, you know, within the dinosaur capital of the world, like they're really doing all the right things. And I would say in like 10 to 15 years, it would definitely be sort of like a Fergus Alora of Alberta or maybe something like the Okanagan, like Penticton, where people really go and spend their summers in that area because there's so much to do. Uh, I just love it. I love it so much. And money is going into this town from the municipal government and from the provincial government. The, the schools are new, the hospital's new, the community center and arena are relatively newer buildings. So there's definitely money going in. This is not a dying town. This is re-blossoming. For sure. And one of the things that I actually really enjoyed because we were there on a weekend, the Friday, Saturday night, they had a portion of the old downtown core shut down. They had a portion of one of the streets shut down and they had, you know, just free games like ladder ball and beanbag toss. And it was right at the Legion. The Legion patio was open and then right across the street from the Legion, there's sort of a um, town square with a stage. And each night they had a different band just playing great, you know, cover tunes. It was a really good vibe. They have an adorable little theater called the Napier Theater which is a movie theater but they were open they I don't know if they were playing movies that night but they had it open and they had the concession open and popcorn that you could buy and walk around the town with like it was a really great vibe I really 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 enjoyed it there are some great restaurants there for a town of Drumheller's size there is a fantastic array of food and I mean like a lot of ethnic diversity there's a really famous eatery there called Bernie and the Boys which was featured on You Gotta Eat Here um, which is sort 
of, I guess, the Canadian version of diners, drive-ins, and dives. We did not get to eat at Bernie and the Boys, which I am still very disappointed about because they were closed, because they were hosting several private functions that weekend. But we did stop by and pick up some of their all-purpose seasoning at one of the local grocery stores. And it is fantastic. And I actually wish that I had bought a second bottle. So if you are in Drumheller um, and you get to eat at Bernie and the Boys, like message us and let us know how it is because it looks fantastic. There is a great micro brewery in Drumheller called Valley Brewing, which looks stunning. It looks like it's fairly brand new. There's a great outdoor patio setup with patio lights and lawn chairs and you can just hang out and it's the perfect place to grab a pint or a flight or do whatever and just hang out. It perplexed me as an Ontarian that there was no food there. We walked in when Bernie and the boys was closed, like hoping for dinner. And it was like all they serve is beer. And that surprised me. Yeah, because if you're not from Ontario, in Ontario, if you have a a liquor establishment where you're serving drinks, you have to have food, even if it's just a bag of chips behind the bar. Mm -hmm. That being said, the beer looked fantastic, but we were really hungry. So we ended up eating elsewhere. But yeah, that although Ontario loves its red tape. So uh, that's maybe it's not all that odd out in Alberta. But there were a fair few number of restaurants that I did notice that were closed that we would have liked to eat at. But a lot of them had uh, notices in the window saying, you know, sorry, closed until further notice because we are short staffed and which just seems to be a bit of a COVID problem in the Western states. Yeah, this was not a drum hiller problem. We noticed lots of places where there were help wanted signs in provinces because they just can't get people to come to work and it's definitely COVID related. Mm -hmm. I would say one thing about drum heller in terms of its walkability and its rideability for bike rides, fantastic. Absolutely great. It is clean. It is safe. There's great trail maps up um, and all of the trails, most of them seem to be paved, the ones that go in and around the river. Uh, Just a really fascinating town to just ride your bike in the neighborhoods and see some of the houses. Yeah, and I just, I want to emphasize it's not about the bike lanes on residential streets because there aren't any. And it's not about the trails. There are a few trails to ride your bikes on. It's just a cool little town that's really easy to ride your bike up and down the streets because it's not super busy with traffic and you don't have to feel unsafe. It's just cool to explore by bike and cover more real estate. Mm -hmm. And the world's tallest dinosaur. So that seems a bit kitsch. Um, You know, if you are inclined to go to Drumheller and be like, there is no way I'm paying $5 to walk up into a Tyrannosaurus's mouth, I highly suggest you do it. The girls and I did it one night while Dan was back at the trailer making dinner and the girls had asked every single day and this is like at the ages of 13 and 16 pretty much they really wanted to go up in the dinosaur's mouth so we did not have small children anymore but even they were fascinated so I thought okay fine you go inside the tourist information center which in itself is fantastic it is very old school they have like a physical board up uh, that lists all of the hotels all of the campgrounds whether they have vacancy what kind of sites they have Uh, they're really helpful really great staff in there and we paid to go up the world's tallest dinosaur who is a woman her name is Tyra Uh, We found out that little tidbit while we were there. The view from the top is just fantastic. We went just as the sun was setting over the Red Deer River. It is a stunning view of the river. You, You get the water tower of the town in the background. It's just, it's really worth it. And only one family or one group is allowed up at the top at a time right now, obviously due to COVID. So we did wait maybe half an hour, 45 minutes. And how it, how they had it set up was you would wait. And when it was your turn, you would climb up to the first landing. And there's sort of three landings as you go up. And the girls and I counted how many stairs. And now I'm... I, I don't know if I wrote it down. It was around 100 stairs or something like that, just over 100 stairs. But there's three landings and you go up to the first landing and there's kind of a stopping area and you have to wait for one group to come down. And then the next group goes up and you go to their landing and you wait. So there's only one group outside in the mouth of the dinosaur at a time which is really all it can fit because it's quite small. But the view is definitely worth it. I mean, it doesn't take a lot more than a few minutes, but you'll get some great photos, you'll get a great view, and the kids will really enjoy it. So I highly recommend that. Absolutely. So groceries. Groceries. So there are three places in town to get groceries. There's a small Walmart on the outskirts of town. There's an extra foods, which would be like uh, Freshco type. I would no say frills. more like no frills. No yeah. frills type grocery store. 
and there's a Friesen or Fressen Brothers uh, grocery store. That was the one that we used. Guard your wallet. There's amazing stuff in this grocery store. <laughs> it reminded me actually of the, the grocery store in Moab where we found all that great stuff. Like It's just like a small town. Like I think there's it's a small chain, let's say. But oh my gosh, they have like fresh, fresh baked goodies. We the, a ton of sourdough stuff. We got sourdough uh, cinnamon buns. We got sourdough bread that had full cloves of roasted garlic in it. It was amazing. We got these amazing soup kits. Oh, these frozen potato skins. And they were potato skins that were fully dressed and frozen that we just popped on the barbecue and cooked one night. Like, oh. The food was amazing. I also want to say that we got some fruits and vegetable milk and <laughs> eggs, you know, the healthy stuff. We didn't just eat cinnamon buns and sourdough toast. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I ate a lot of cinnamon buns and sourdough toast. But uh, it's more of a premium grocery store in cost, like there was a Starbucks inside, etc. But holy cow, it was fantastic. I really, really highly recommend it. And it's also kind of located in kind of the center of town we'll say near the canadian tire and mark's work warehouse big parking lot stuff like that Mm -hmm. there are a lot of dinosaurs found in that area in that swath of badlands hence why there's a museum and dinosaur provincial park and all of that in that area of alberta but the the town you know is really done a great job with that they have a series of dinosaur statues all throughout the town so picture you know, like those moose we have in Ontario, which I don't even know how many of them are standing anymore. That was kind of a thing back in the day. Five, ten years ago in Toronto. Where you'd have gigantic moose and they were all painted up. It's kind of like that, except the theme is dinosaurs on vacation. So you'll see these dinosaur statues and some of them are two feet tall and some of them are like 15 feet tall where they're all posed. They're sitting on benches. They're just like hanging out in the town. They're driving their motorcycle down the road and you can take pictures with them. And it's just, you know, there's a bit of a dinosaur trail. You can take a walk map and you can take your kids around and and meet all the dinosaurs and take their photo and it just makes for a really fun night if you're wandering the town. So I guess on services do we want to talk about the services we encountered when the jack broke? Yeah so we had a little bit of a test of marital bliss on this. Um, We pulled in on a Friday around 3 30 or 4 into the campsite and the electric jack wouldn't work and so for those of you that have maybe not joined since the beginning of the podcast, we have a 2,900 2900 foot, we have a 29 (laughs) foot trailer and it's 7,500 pounds dry plus all of our stuff inside it. So it's not a small trailer. And the jack had been working slowly and I had attributed that to a bad battery. And in fact, we did have a bad battery, but by the time we pulled into the RV park, the electric jack failed to go up and down to the point where when we put in a new fuse hit the up button it would blow the fuse right away jack was really hot we need to be able to raise and lower the tongue of the trailer a couple of times so we can take the sway bars off and so we can detach the truck from the trailer normally in an electric jack there is a manual override which lets you crank by hand to raise and lower the trailer however the entire jack was seized i put all of my weight behind it and it was only barely raising like maybe an eighth of an inch every time we we reached the point where we were able to get the sway bars off the ball of the hitch was still underneath the tongue of the trailer and so in the greatest of hillbilly redneck solutions dan stood on the hitch of on the truck which pushed the whole back end of the truck down which was just enough room for melina to hop in the driver's seat and pull forward now you want to paint the picture of kind of the layout of the site and why it's important that we get detached yeah, so this there was two sites in the entire park that had signs on the site post that said, if you're parking in these two sites, you basically have to pull all the way forward and then you need to unhitch and you need to park your truck at the back of the site. Fine, no problem. We were unhooking anyway because we were planning on doing day trips. So while all this was going on, we were basically in the middle of the road because that's where the truck happened to be when we pulled all the way forward so that everything lined up for the services. I'm sure, well, actually, in fact, I know there were people out there staring at us as we were trying to get this unhooked and Dan standing on the truck so that you know it lowered enough to clear and so I could pull ahead while he's standing on the ball hitch like it was just a whole holy disaster but we did get it enough so that I could pull the truck out and then Dan hopped off and the truck kind of popped back up again 
And luckily enough, the trailer was level enough. It wasn't perfectly level, but it was level enough to run the fridge. It was level enough to run the AC. And it was level enough to make us feel like we weren't going to fall off the bed when we were sleeping. So we left well enough alone and went in search of a solution. This was after we had vigorous debate about whether we were going to try and lower it. And Melina said we should just leave well enough alone, which is what we did. So Because I'm smart. Needless to say, we went to Alberta. We saw a rodeo. Regrettably, it was a goat rodeo of our own making. <laughs> So now that we have the truck decoupled from the trailer, we still need to be able to get the trailer back onto the truck and we still need to be able to fix the electric jack. So Molina found the name of a very helpful mobile RV technician who I gave a phone call to and he was very helpful to us. He said, listen, your trailer's five or six years old. It sounds like you're electric jack needs to be replaced the entire thing is seized which is why it won't work in manual mode and unfortunately he didn't have a new one to put on and that's not his fault but he suggested that we go to the local auto parts store so we left the campsite got to the auto parts store before they closed at five o'clock on friday really helpful guy at the parts desk showed him a picture of what we needed he went down and we checked the shelves together unfortunately he didn't have what we needed and he said listen we can't get a delivery on saturday nothing comes in on monday i wouldn't be able to get you anything until tuesday and we had to leave on monday so he suggested that we go to canadian tire so we went across the street to canadian tire uh, where it was self-serve in the in the parts aisle and they did not have what we needed and we needed a jack that could hold 3500 pounds and it had to have a certain bolt configuration so i I shouldn't put too much blame on canadian tire at this point yeah at this point we were just looking for a manual jack that we could just use to get us through the rest of the trip because we still had you know almost two weeks left of the trip uh so unfortunately it was the weight limit that was the problem we could only find one that was max 2,500 pounds. So in walks Melina's beautiful brain, which decided that we needed a 15 ton bottle jack. Pretty much, yep. To help us. And the reason is because of the weight distribution sway bar system we have, when you hook up your ball hitch, you then need to raise the truck and the trailer a little bit in order to be able to get the bars on properly. So the entire hitch system comes with sort of like a big crowbar that's custom designed to get your bars onto the hitch. And that requires a whole lot of manpower, a whole lot of muscle, and it's really difficult to do. So even at the best of times, you do need to raise that hitch up even a little bit, if not the, if not the whole way to take that pressure off so we can get the bars on. Our dilemma was, okay, well, we can reverse the process that we used to unhook and have Dan stand on the bumper, which is what he ended up have to, having to do. And I would carefully back up while he gave me directions because unfortunately he had to stand in front of the backup camera just where he was positioned on the uh, bumper of the truck to get us backed in and then when he hopped off the the truck would raise and slide into the ball hitch which was fine but we could not move it up anymore to get the bars on and the bars really were not going to go on if hitch was too low. So my idea was to take this 15 ton bottle jack and we could use that once the ball hitch was connected, we could use that to raise the entire hitch mechanism, put the bars on and then lower the bottle uh, jack and it would, it would hook up. So in theory, fantastic idea. In reality, we actually didn't need it because we left the truck slightly unlevel. It was high enough once we hooked up that we could get those bars on just by sheer force. So day two of the goat rodeo finals, we managed to get hooked up and we managed to get back on the road. And the bottle jack has since been returned to Canadian Tire because we never opened it. But needless to say, the story continues because on Monday morning, we're rolling down the highway. We still need to get a jack, manual or electric, to finish the rest of our week and a half, two weeks on the road. So I was able to phone ahead to... uh, RV dealership in the outskirts of Calgary, Rangeland RV, spoke to the fellow at the parts desk. He had the right jack and said, maybe I can get somebody in the shop to install it for you. So we pulled in. I went to the parts desk. He goes, this is the jack, but I can't get anybody to install it. The shop is completely full, but you're welcome to change the jack yourself in our parking lot. So that's what we did in 10 degree weather. So it was kind of rainy, cold, windy we pulled around behind the dealership we had to take the bikes off the trailer because the bikes are over top of the old jack we had to disconnect three bolts and one electrical connection so for anybody who's super simple you did it with the tool kit that standard tool kit 
that we the, always tell you to keep mm-hmm. in your truck. <laughs> right. No, there was no oddball size wrenches or ratchets or anything else. It was all straightforward stuff. Three bolts, one electrical connection, took the old one off. The new one fit into the same holes same connection and we were off to the races it was really simple i kind of knew how to do it i confirmed it on a three minute youtube video and we were in and out of that dealership in an hour mm-hmm. and the important thing is if we hadn't had that toolkit i'm sure the dealership would have been fine to lend us a couple of wrenches to get it done but having that as kind of a safety net in your truck once we used the jack a couple more times we could then go and just retighten the bolts and make sure that it stays nice and secure yeah because after you've used it a couple times just go back and double check everything's still nice and tight and stuff like that Mm -hmm. okay so that's the saga of the jack so let's back up back to drumheller again and we will talk about the royal tyrell museum so i keep stumbling on this because we constantly call it the royal tyrell museum which is kind of when you read it, that's how my brain says to say it, say it. And Dan and I have been calling it the Royal Tyrell. Like always in my family, we call it the Royal Tyrell. It's not. It's Tyrell because I found that out on the internet today. So it is actually named after Joseph B. Tyrell, who on August 12th, 1884, stumbled upon a 70 million year old dinosaur skull, the first of its species ever found just a few kilometers from where the museum now stands and is Canada's only museum solely dedicated to the study of ancient life. So the Royal Tyrell Museum is located seven and a half kilometers, so just shy of five miles from downtown Drumheller, and it's located in Midland Provincial Park. So you think that it might be located in Dinosaur Provincial Park. However, that park is roughly an hour and 45 minutes southeast of the Royal Tyrell. So stay tuned in early October as we are going to talk to our friends Janine and Ben, who are brand new motorhoming family of seven, and they ventured west this summer a couple of weeks before we did, and they were able to visit and spend some time in Dinosaur Provincial Park, which was kind of the highlight of Janine's life. So we are going to hear from them, get their impression of the area and their tips on what to see. The Royal Tyrell Museum holds one of the world's largest collections of dinosaurs, and it's recognized as a center of excellence for paleontology. The collection is actually so vast that there are still over 2,500 unprepared specimens in the collection just awaiting further investigation, a lot of which can be seen within the museum itself. So there's sort of like a glass wall gallery, which during working hours is where teams work to investigate the discoveries that they found, extract them from the casings uh, when they come in from the field. It's a really, really neat process to watch. And take note, however, if you visit on a weekend that the area might be void of active work if nobody's actually on duty, but it's still neat to kind of look into those windows and see how those processes are done and look at the the equipment that they use to do it. Yes. So let me talk about this museum real quick, my impression. We've been to like the road. Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. We've been to Smithsonian's in Washington. We've seen some of the great museums in London, England, and they're all great museums. This museum, probably more than any of those museums, is something for everybody for all ages and not to talk those museums down because like the Air and Space Museum is still my favorite museum in the world. They're not as stuffy. There's something for everybody, for every you know, young kid can be engaged, adult parents can be engaged, grandma and grandpa can be engaged. So there's something for everybody. They've really done a great job curating it for everyone. It's very interactive as well. A lot of hands-on displays, you know, stuff at all eye levels to keep you know, like Dan said, everybody of of every age group entertained. It's just, it's really well laid out and it's not overly large. If you're moderately able, or even if you need accessibility help, they rent strollers, they rent wheelchairs. You can bring your ECV scooters in with you. Like it's, but it's a reasonable size. It's not like a mammoth, mammoth building. No pun intended, (laughs) woolly mammoth. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, it's late at night, you guys. It's not a mammoth building where you just are exhausted by the time you finish walking the indoor exhibits. A couple other things I would say to know before you go is that a large, a significantly large portion of museum activities are actually out of doors. Now they're all optional, but there is a lot of out out of door time if you want that. So there is a signed interpretive trail, which is out behind the museum. It is free. It takes about an hour if you're going to stop and read all of the plaques. There's also connector trails, which go off museum property into Midland Provincial Park itself. There is an outdoor simulated dinosaur dig, which is an additional $15 per person. It runs on weekends and it's about 
75 minutes long and that's for the kiddos to kind of do a simulated dig and pull out fossils. There is a dino site hike, which is kind of cool. It's $10 per person. It enables you to go out into the Badlands off the beaten path with a guide from the museum and see what kind of fossils you can find. That takes an hour and a half. And then there's also the Seven Wonders of the Badlands, which is a 60 minute tour. It's $8 a person and it sends you out with a geologist to find out what the rocks uh, around the museum say about the changing environment of Alberta. So with all of that being said, and all of those things outside, there's also a playground that's open in the summer months outside, you basically want to pack for the weather. So bring a jacket, sturdy shoes, water, backpack, a hat, sunscreen, etc. if you plan on utilizing any of those outdoor experiences. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about parking when you pull in. You're going to pull in, nice smooth road, you're going to drive up. Now we did not bring the trailer with us, we just brought the truck, but the parking lot was packed. It was like trying to find a spot at Walmart on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're, you can bring your truck and trailer there or your RV, if that's the case, you should go straight to the overflow parking. Um, give you a word of advice is drive up slow, head to the overflow parking, but the signage isn't the best signage in the world and you don't want to make a turn prematurely and find yourself stuck where it's going to be hard to back up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, automatically, if you're towing, just head to the lower overflow parking lot. During the summer months, there is a tram that runs between the museum up on the hill and the lower parking lot that will just take people back and forth all a day long. There is no overnight parking, no boondocking. There is no cam overnight camping in Midland Provincial Park. It is a day use only park. So unfortunately, it can't be used for any of those uses. When we were there, and obviously we were recording this in September of 2021, there are still COVID restrictions in place. Masks were optional when we went. However, they are now mandatory as of September 3rd all over Alberta. You must pre-book the tickets in advance. And in saying that, I was actually very surprised um, with how busy it was. Because when you go online, you have to pre-book, pre-pay for tickets. You have to pick your time slot during the day. And there's like a three-hour window where you can pick your time slot to visit. And when we got there, like when I say it was busy, it was busy for like non-COVID times. There was there was swaths of people at every exhibit. I feel like we walked through some of the exhibits a whole lot quicker than we otherwise would have because there was like people just like reaching over your shoulder to take a photo. And like it was like sardines in some of the exhibits. Um, not a lot of distancing, etc. But I don't know. I don't know what it, it was the end of the summer though. Yeah, summer vacation for school students was coming to a close within in that week or they were going back to school the next week. So I think people were trying to squeeze in one last trip. Listen, if you have the opportunity to do it in the shoulder seasons, when kids are in school, that'd probably be a great time to stop by when it's not too busy. Mm -hmm. So the cafeteria is currently closed as well. However, they did have food trucks on site. I would imagine that's probably only for the summer season. Uh, but it is the kind of place where you can find a grassy spot to sit down. You can find a bench. If you want to pack a picnic with you, just make sure you're taking all of your garbage uh, out with you. In terms of pricing, super reasonable for the quality of museum that you're getting. Adults are $21. Seniors are 14 Youth 7 to 17 years of age are $10 and the under 7 crowd is free. Now for anybody in the military community with a CF1 card, you actually get free admittance. However, in COVID times, they want you to buy online for full price. And then when you get to the gate, present your CF1 card and they will actually refund you the cost of the admission, which is fantastic. Uh, so summer season for the Royal Tyrol is um, May 15th to August 31st every year. It's open every day from 10 to 5. And the fall hours run from September 1st to May 14th. They are open Tuesday to Saturdays, 10 to 5. And they are open every holiday Monday. Other than that, they are closed on Mondays. As I mentioned, stroller and wheelchair rentals. You can rent them for $3 a day, which is fantastic. And they have these great fun books for kids that they can sort of read and follow along and, you know, have scavenger hunts and look for exhibits and sort of draw their own conclusions about what they're seeing. And those are only $6 and you can get those uh, at the gate when you sign in. So in terms of accessibility, uh, like I said, it's not a huge museum. However, the trail out back, you do need to go up several stairs to get to the trail, which is kind of further up the hill than the museum is. But you do go through some elevation changes on that trail. It's mostly, it's paved for some of the way and then the rest of it is just gravel. But I would say you would probably need to be able to walk five or six city blocks. If you can do that, you can do the trail out back. Yeah, there was people of all ages. There was toddlers right up to senior citizens. So don't talk yourself out of taking this trail. Mm -hmm. So timeline. 
Timeline, I'd say you probably want to budget most of the day. This is going to be the main event of your day. So don't try and schedule two big things on this day. This will be your big thing. And I think, you know, it's going to take up most of your day if you're going to go and see everything properly. Mm -hmm. So one cool thing, and you'll actually see some signs at the museum, which doesn't only apply to the museum. It actually applies to everywhere in the area. And that is uh, about fossil discovery. So the rule of thumb, I guess, or what they ask you to do is that if you are out exploring and one of the great things about the Drumheller Valley is it really is like the Wild West in terms of there's not a lot of restrictions, not a lot of um, roped off areas or, you know, fences or gates like you are free to roam in the Badlands. And so if you find a fossil or an interesting, unique discovery on your walk, you're asked to take a photo of it, preferably with something beside it to sort of provide scale. And of course, leave the fossil in place. It is absolutely illegal to remove fossils from any area in Alberta, but use GPS if you can on your device to maybe drop a pin into Google Maps of where you are, make note of the Latin longitude, and email it to the museum with your findings and they will go and research it. Yeah, and this is only common sense. And they actually had a really good, one of the exhibits did a really great job at talking about how some of the countries that do natural resource exploration are one of their main contributors of new finds. So yeah, it's common sense. Don't be taking that stuff and hiding it and keeping it for yourself. Mm -hmm. So that is the basics on the museum. It definitely um, has to be on your to-do list if you go into the Drumheller area. As far as the next episode, we are going to talk about the rest of our trip, which was the world famous hoodoos, Horseshoe Canyon, a little bit about the coal mining history and some of the coal mines you can visit in the area. There's a great suspension bridge. There's fantastic ghost towns. There is a ton of stuff still to cover. And that's why we broke up this uh, episode into two parts. So we will address all of the rest of that uh, in two weeks. Have a great couple of weeks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>